What is up everyone? Welcome to part two of this behind the scenes making of the G3 showcase video. Um, if you haven't seen part one, check it out. If you haven't seen the G3 series, check it out. I basically kit out this Power Mac G3 blue and white and create the world's fastest Power Mac G3. Let's dive right in where we left off. This morning we went to Maplin and pretty much instantly I found exactly what I was looking for. And this is what I needed, one of these. I can't believe I messed up the purchase of that cable, I really can't. But anyway, this is the full six pin Firewire 400 connector. Obviously that goes into the machine and it allows me to plug in the four pin little mini DV Firewire connector and basically piggybacks the cable and turns it into a proper Firewire cable on one end. Now in the last video, I bashed Maplin's um, a little bit and I have to say today's experience was really good. I mean all of my experiences there have been really good. Super friendly staff, a big big range of stock and I was editing that video and even after I posted it I was feeling a little bit guilty about what I said about Maplin's so apologies to anybody that works in Maplin's that watches my videos. I wasn't bashing them. Um, I had a look at some of the PC components today and I am going to be building a PC soon, which of course I will be documenting on the channel. I'm going to build it for somebody else. And they happen to have the power supply in stock that I want to get for this build. And I looked at the price and it was £7 more expensive than I can get it for on Amazon, which is not crazy. And I could have walked away with it right there. So if I was in a rush, I would have definitely bought it there. But then again, it's only like a 35 quid power supply, 40 quid power supply. So a £7 difference is, is quite a lot. But anyway, I know this isn't about the G3 in PowerPC, but Maplins, I do apologise. On your website, you said that you had one of these in stock and you did have one of these in stock and I'm very grateful for that. So I've got what I need and yeah, I just wanted to make a slight apology there before we went any further because I felt guilty. Let's start again by booting her up. In this part, we're gonna delve into things a little bit deeper and I'm gonna start with the camcorder stuff. Now, the way I see it, in terms of planning this video, if this doesn't work out for whatever reason, then I need to rethink a lot of things. So it's a very important step, I think, to do first. So what I did was I bought, when I got this camcorder, I was bidding on camcorders for a very long time. Um, and I'm so pleased I won this one because as I said in the previous video, it's a very, very fine specimen of a mini DV camcorder. Um, so I went out and got some tapes. I got three Sony 60 minute tapes, they're DV premium tapes. This of course is digital video, so it makes almost no difference what quality of tape you get, but I just wanted to get nice tapes anyway. Um, obviously in the analog world, it makes a very, very big difference what tape you choose. It's make or break in terms of the way your footage looks, but definitely way less in the digital video world. Um, so I have one tape in the camcorder now. I showed you guys that in part one. Um, that's the case for it. These each hold 60 minutes, so I, I really doubt I'll need all three for this project. I'll probably use just one to tell you the truth, um, unless I have a lot of shots that I redo and things like that. But um, I, I'm very much, I never delete any footage. I never overwrite any footage. I'm, I keep pretty much everything I record and um, that, that is true for all formats that I happen to record in. For those of you who don't know, I still have my Sony Handycam, my Video 8 Sony Handycam, and I still use it to record little family things here and there and stuff. It's just such a wonderful camcorder and I really love using it. And I know it's, you know, 4.3 and analog video and old tape and everything, but I just still really, really enjoy it. So I hope I'm gonna get as much enjoyment out of this camera as well. So it's got a tape in it. I think we should just try and record some stuff and see where we go from there. So I've popped my normal camera on the tripod. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna put any of this footage into this video, because obviously this will be a 1080p sequence, so any footage I do put in will be upscaled and probably look terrible, but I could do it just for a little demonstration. Um, but let's first of all do a demonstration of the camcorder itself. Obviously I've charged the battery, so that's one good thing. Um, Let's open the screen, as you can see, a nice 16 by nine screen. Turn it on, lens cap automatically opens, and we are up and running straight away. 
Um, it says set date and time. I, I will set the date and time just so that we get proper time stamps on our video. There we go. So I've set the date and time and we are indeed um, all ready to go by the looks of it. I'm on auto. We've got full battery. I'm just going to give this whirl how it is right now and press record and see what happens. The only thing that I can't suss out is where the heck are the transport controls for the cassette deck? I have no idea. Ah, let's go for it anyway. Start recording. Okay, so we are recording and the first thing that I notice right off the bat, let's let's get rid of this because I'll just use this footage, why the heck not? This footage is going to look terrible, folks, because, as I said, this camera obviously creates a 1080p timeline and you're looking at standard definition footage, so that's something to bear in mind. Another thing that I'm noticing right away is I'll actually turn this camera back on for a little bit of a comparison between the lenses. So this is me standing just behind this tripod and this is how much of this setup I can get in the frame. If I turn this on, Take a look at how much more wide angle that is. With the camera right next to the setup, I can get the whole setup in the frame. Whereas with this camera, to get the equivalent amount of setup in the frame, I've got to go right back. I'm literally standing by the door to achieve this. Um, so definitely a lot has moved on wide angle lenses. But I do remember that my first ever Panasonic camera, the one that I bought for YouTube, um, in around 2010, I think it was, 2009, 2010, that camera had pretty much the equivalent lens to this camera by the looks of it. Very, very difficult to capture certain shots in a small room. It's actually looking really good. So I think we're going to call it a day here for this first test clip and we're going to try and import some into Final Cut. So let's stop recording and let's switch her off for now while we get the cabling set up. I'm dying to see if this camcorder performs properly and without any hiccups. So let's bring up Final Cut and do our cabling and things. Great success, folks. It could be a little bit, <laughs> little bit thinner profile, but that's okay. I'm sure we've got enough space back there. All right, guys, so we're capturing the last clip that I just recorded. Everything seems to be going okay, so... Hmm... Dropped frames were detected during the last capture attempt. So, by the looks of it, we have sort... No, we haven't sorted it. That's okay. That was a little bit better. It captured for a, quite a bit more time like that. I selected my secondary SSD as the scratch disk um, because it was still my, my primary SSD, which, of course, the application itself and the OS is loaded on so it's not recommended to capture to the same drive obviously so all I'm going to do now is ignore the I didn't know I'd have to do this uh, didn't know if I'd have to do this but I'm just going to ignore the dropped frames during capture whatever that option is here we go abort capture on dropped frames abort capture on time code break I'll uncheck both of those and hit OK and now it should just capture regardless and then we'll take a look and see how the footage is affected. So we've captured, there's our clip. Um, it gave me a couple of errors about time code so yeah. Um, the sequence is set to 16.9 obviously but it captured in 4.3. If you look at the QuickTime uh, videos they are 4.3 so if I open this you can see that it's sort of squished in but um, if you take a look at the actual Final Cut window, obviously if I was to export this now it would be a 16x9 video if I had the correct export settings. So I can play back really comfortably in here. Online, and you're looking at standard definition footage, so that's something to bear in mind. Now what I'm going to do is export this. I'm going to export it as a file that I can view on my main system. Why am I going to do that? I use my main system every day of my life to do millions of different things. So I'm accustomed to the displays, I'm accustomed to the speakers, I'm accustomed to how things are meant to look. And I absolutely 100% need to see this footage on that system before I can dedicate my time and effort to making this video. It sounds a bit stupid, you know, I can see the video right there, but I can't, I can't really work out 
the quality of it, if that makes sense. I need to see it on my newer system. Might defeat the whole retro object of it, but it's not going to be a regular thing. I'll just um, export this one clip just to see how it looks. I need to kind of get a feeling for how it looks because I, I just can't tell. Check this out, guys. Super quick export on the old uh, G3 Blue and White here, the world's fastest G3 Blue and White. I know it's only a very short, like one minute clip or whatever it is, but check that out. It's just crunching away. And of course, this is DV footage, so there's no need for any weird rendering to happen or whatever. I can just drop it straight into a DV timeline and it works perfectly. So let's take a look at that exported file. I exported it to the desktop just for an easy life. Here we go. Let's take a little look at the file. What have we got? We've got oh, nearly half a gig. I just exported it as it was. Kind Final Cut Pro movie file. Can I play that on my modern system? Um, more info. 720 by 576. Stevie Pal. Oh, it's a two minute clip. That exported really quickly, but of course it was doing no compression or conversion or anything as far as I know, just saving a Final Cut movie. So let's see if we can play that on our system. Yes, of course we can play it. So this is actual size. This is a 1920 by uh, 1200 monitor. So it's pretty much 1080, uh, 16 by 10 equivalent of a 1080p monitor, all three of them, same model. Um, so this is a standard definition PAL sized image on this display. We'll blast it up to full screen and take a little look. And the first thing that I notice right off the bat, let's, let's get rid of this because when, and you're looking at standard definition footage, so that's something to bear in mind. Another thing that I'm noticing right Tasty, real tasty. Away is. I'll actually turn this camera back on. You guys won't be able to see the full quality of this footage. You, you'd have seen this clip already if I can figure out the weird thing. But you would have seen this clip already, and it's been upscaled to 1080p for you guys to see it. I, I may, I may crunch this video down. A bit I don't know. So this is me standing just behind this tripod. Ooh, this is how much okay. of this setup I can get in the frame. Okay, but okay, okay. On, take a look at Overall picture, I'm happy. Obviously there are some terrible, terrible drops of frame rate to the point where the video grinds to a halt and skips all over the place. Um, I'm going to have to take a look at these hard drives sooner than later. Because if I can record to the RAID hard drives, it may be slightly more comfortable doing so than recording to the SSD. Um, the other thing that I need to take a look at is the frame rate. The movement looks a little... I don't know how to describe it. it it's going to be difficult for you guys to judge as well, because obviously this video is in a different frame rate. But it just looks a little... I don't know, there's something going on with the frame rate. And also I need to look at the optical image stabilisation. It looked a lot smoother on the camera LCD than it does after it's been captured. So a good start, a good first attempt. Let's carry on chugging away and see how we get, see how we go. Um, really, really hope this G3 can cope with capturing this stuff with the proper discs. Really hope. So I've just been through the camcorder settings. Optical image, optical image stabilization is indeed switched on. I've fiddled with the audio settings a little bit because there were some weird um, settings. I've turned wind reduction off and all that stuff because. Um, I didn't know if that could affect the quality. I'm not sure if I'm going to be even using the audio from this camera anyway. But the microphone is on the front, so if you're talking from behind, um, unlike the current camera I'm using, it would be very unlikely for my voice to affect the uh, microphone in a sort of windy kind of way. So I've turned the wind noise reduction thing off because we're indoors, and that's pretty much it. There are not many settings on this camera at all. Optical image stabilization is on, 16 by 9 recording is on as we know. So the card is still working okay. I've just changed the jumper settings um, and it is seeing the drive. This is only a 250 gig capacity because I'm not set to RAID 0 at the moment. So that's okay, it's still seeing both the drives. Let me try and put it back to the RAID 0 configuration and see if a little jiggle around did indeed help it. Took out the card to try and find the model number. Um, to look in the manual, found the model number, put it in on the web, found the card, can't download the manual because something weird's going on with the website which is really annoying. So what I'm going to do is I just stick it back in, I've fiddled about with it a little bit and just flapped it around in the air and hopefully it'll now work. So let's see. No joy yet. I'm fiddling around with different configurations 
with the switches just to see what drives appear when and how it's behaving and then I'm going to start swapping the drives over and things like that. Um, I guess it is definitely a possibility that one of the drives has died but that's what I'm going to try and figure out now. I've checked all of the cabling, everything is fine so don't quite know what's happening and this poor G3 is going through a reloop cycle again because I'm just constantly restarting it trying to figure out what's wrong with these drives. So it sees a 250 gig drive with one of them unplugged. I'm going to swap them around so I'm going to unplug that one, plug this one in. If it sees that 250 gig drive then I can raise them both individually, plug them both back in and then hope that um, if I reset the card to RAID 0 I can then reformat the single volume and I have myself a lovely RAID 0 setup once again because man it was quick. No joy with the second disc on that port, I'll try and swap it to the first port. No sign of the second drive at all. So do we have a cable issue? We have joy, IDE storage, all I did was pick up the drive. <laughs> um, yeah, I have no idea. So I'm going to put them back down. Well, I'm going to erase this, unpartition it. Same with the other one. Put them back down, plug them in, and then try and start all over again. But I'm glad that the drive is not broken, or the IDE cable, because they were expensive. Well, the drives weren't expensive, but the IDE cables were. Here's the culprit. This is the culprit. Come on. Ooh. Not bad. Normally it doesn't work when I shout at it. This is the culprit, folks. Um, yeah, this could have potentially damaged my drives or my RAID controller. Very, very, very annoyed. It means that that drive has been through hell and back in terms of power delivery. I would not blame that drive right now if it died. This is going in the bin. I could be shouting at the cable, but it could be the IDE connector on the drive itself. Sorry, the uh, Molex connector. Really hope it isn't, but it is a loose power connection. When I held the drive in my hand, it was working because it was sort of torquing the connector downwards. Now that I've put the drive back flat, it wasn't working. But if I pushed the power connector, it was working. So I'm hoping that the two remaining Molex connectors in here can be stretched to reach both drives. Let's give it a go. It reaches with no problems at all. I've got it coming from, from over here and plugging into one drive and then eventually plugging into the other. But we're just going to test this drive on its own first and we're going to erase it. Then we're going to test the other drive on its own and erase it. And then we'll reset the RAID controller and we should be good to go. So let's get some juice to the system to see if we were being stopped by one cruddy Molex connector. Boom! It's coming up without us holding the drive. So that is good. Right, I'm just going to go and unpartition this drive completely because I've messed around with this stuff way too far now. It needs to be fully reset. So there's one drive unpartitioned. Time for another shutdown so that I can unpartition the other drive. I just want to make sure that everything is fresh 100%. And there's the other drive sorted. So all we've got left to do now is shut down, plug both drives in. As you can see, just need to plug this in to the card and then uh, flip it back to RAID 0 and re-erase our new RAID volume and we are sorted. Moment of truth. One of the coolest things about choosing to put the IDE drives back into this system is definitely how beefy the cables look. I love the internal look of this machine. Um, I'm not sure if I'd successfully get two SATA cards working together anyway, but having two SATA drives, and of course they're two SSDs in our case, and then two IDE drives, I think it's just a wonderful blend of the old and the new and with the RAID 0 on the ATA discs it's a very like old school way of getting a quick disc but also in line um, in line with the world's fastest G3 project because it is super quick um, as you guys saw from the benchmarks on the previous video so I haven't closed up just in case this isn't it for this hard drive saga I hope it is because I wasn't expecting to spend this much time on the drives. I wanted to be fiddling in Final Cut way more than this, but that's okay. We've got our hand stuck into a little bit of hardware, which is always fun. And hopefully when we boot up now, we should get um, the whole, this disc is not readable by this computer message. But 
The machine is taking a little longer than it usually does to boot, but that's okay. I'm not going to start panicking yet. Come on, give us the message. Give us the message. And he's, yes, now we are talking. So we want to initialize these disks and it should recognize it as a 500 gigabyte volume. It is super easy to tell if a RAID 0 is working correctly because of the capacity that it reports with two, two drives. 467.5, perfect, awesome, lovely, sorted. So our three disks are back. Why did that Molex extension give us that trouble? A, it's a cheap cable. B, I've had it for ages and even since I've had it, it's been second hand, third hand, God knows where I even got it. It came in a box load of stuff. But this is a warning to anybody that wants to tinker with these machines. Normally, you'd sort of disregard a cable failure um, because there are so many things that can go wrong with RAID controllers and hard drives and all that sort of thing. You instantly look at the RAID card, you instantly look at the drives, which was exactly what I was doing, but it was something way, way, way simpler. It was a Molex extension cable. And a lot of that could be down to the fact that this is an oven door case. Now, it maybe isn't because the cable wasn't going on the motherboard end at all, so the open close nature of the case may not have affected it but still the connectors are very close to the hinge of the case and I have had a few instances where cables have now died in power max and I think it's because of the oven door you open and close them so much that they're just wiggling themselves free or they're talking and they're breaking in the, in the middle or you know whatever's happening to these cables it is a lot of motion that you don't normally get in your average PC case and those Molex connectors are very, very close to the hinge. Drives themselves are right there, as you guys can see. So of course there's gonna be a little bit of play when the door opens and closes, but I reckon we are in the safe zone now. We have our scratch disc, so in theory, with this lovely, reliable, speedy, mechanical scratch disc, we should be able to capture with minimal problems with our camcorder. I mean, you could capture DV footage on an iMac G3 flawlessly, so, I'm not too sure why we're getting some issues like that. It could be software related, I don't know, but giving it the best possible disk to capture to is definitely right. And maybe the SSD is a tiny bit faster in a benchmark, but the uh, mechanical drives are definitely, definitely what the machine would be more accustomed to, so more reliable in this, um, in this instance. Man, I really do know all the technical terminology, don't I? <laughs> not. So I've just copied an album to and from the drive, played it from the drive, working fine, lovely and quick. I was going to X-Bench it, but it, I know it's in RAID 0, I know it's speedy, it was, it was a cable issue. So we are now back up and running exactly where we were. If I get any performance issues with it, I will then take numbers from X-Bench and compare them to the benchmarks in the previous videos. Um, so now what I'm going to do is jump back into, ah, oh, damn it, jump back into... Final Cut Pro 3 and configure my scratch disk properly. So we've got the time code break warning again, but, 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 I think I found the answer to my problem. Guys, I am having just a, an incredible, incredible time. Quit, don't save. Whoops, I pressed cancel instead. I am really enjoying learning all of this stuff. So, apparently, when you capture, using log and capture on Final Cut, when you capture DV, you should not have a journaled hard drive. I did not know that. Time to re-erase. Check it out, check it out. I did not know that at all, this is awesome. Just had a little Google and thought I'd take a little look. And it should be macOS extended, non-journaled. Sweet! Yet another attempt. I've um, selected, you know, this will stop if it drops frames because I've checked or unchecked that preference option depending on how it's worded, I can't remember. Aha, okay, we've dropped frames. Okay, that's okay, right. More investigation. So I'm trashing the preferences to start over again. So we've got the Final Cut Pro user data, that can go as well as the file itself. Um, let's delete it from the spotlight search. Now in trash, we should have the user preferences for final cut. There we go. That's good, empty. 
Now when we open Final Cut it should have completely forgotten everything that we've done, including my screen layout, I think. Yeah, there we go. It's asking us straight away on boot up, which is nice. So we're DV PAL, of course. Primary scratch disk, we're going to select as a scratch disk. User mode standard. OK. Aha, lovely. So as you can see, we've got a lovely fresh final cut. So let's sort out our windows. Arrange. Dual screen 16 by 9. That'll do us for now. Now with our sequence, we want to view us medium icons, which is just the way I like it. Anamorphic. This is G3 test. And now we want to go into preferences. We want to go over and check that our scratch disk is set properly. 467.3 gig. 467.3 gig, yeah, it's the Final Cut Scratch, lovely jubbly, that's all good. Now, I assume it's going to do the exact same thing again, but I was just sort of clutching at straws. So we'll have to uncheck those abort options and then have a little look at an export again to see how it is. I may have accidentally deleted the footage, so I don't know if you guys will have seen it. I'm getting a little bit confused now with everything that we've tried. This does happen, the confusion sets in. So it's been getting to a certain point and then it's been dropping frames. But, ah, yeah, see? Dropping frames there, it'll abort. There it goes, okay. Yet another attempt. So it will not abort this time, but I wanna see what the finished product looks like. I think I'm gonna do a little bit more research. Um, last time I logged DV, I had a white MacBook. And, you know, 2.16 gigahertz Core 2 Duo, considerably more powerful than this. Had no issues on that machine logging standard definition DV whatsoever, obviously. Um, but I don't know whether it's the machine or me or what. I don't know. We'll see. I'll do a bit more research. Um, you know, this was technically before my time um, in terms of my own camcorder experience. The only time that I've used DV is when I've been editing somebody else's project and they've recorded on DV. So it's quite fun. It really is quite fun to mess around with this. I'm just so glad we got those hard drives working again. Ah, uh, yeah, little drop frame there. Quite considerable. So, no luck with any alterations in Final Cut. Um, I'm trying my best, but I am gradually running out of options, but this is only my first go, so that's okay. I'm still at the level where I'm enjoying. Now, why am I in software update? Well, I thought that maybe if there was an update to Final Cut, we'd be we'd be okay. Well, I might as well update this stuff. Something different to do. There's an update to Apple Intermediate Codec. Improved compatibility and reliability for Final Cut Express HD and iLife 05 users. It is recommended for all users of Apple Intermediate Codec 1.0 who are using QuickTime 7. So, yeah. Um, let's just update anyway and see what happens. There's no harm in updating. I've unchecked the OS update, which is obviously very important. Okay, so I'm deep into the settings now. I've managed to change one thing to make my life quite a bit easier. I've selected Anamorphic 16x9 by, by duplicating the DV PAL Capture Scratch preset, making my own copy, selecting the checkbox, and setting that as the default capture profile, meaning that the files that I now get from the camera uh, the files themselves are 16 by 9, which is great because it gives me raw 16 by 9, well, not raw, but um, DV PAL 16 by 9 QuickTime files right after capturing, meaning that I don't need to import them into a sequence and re-export in order to get a 16 by 9 QuickTime file. So that's really good. Now, I'm using, um, I just deselected high quality video playthrough to see if that would make a little difference. Not sure whether that means while it's capturing, but I'm now going to deselect this. Capture card supports simultaneous playthrough and capture. So if I deselect that, maybe it won't show me a preview. The video plays on the camera screen anyway, so that's fine. Maybe it won't show me a preview on this monitor, and then that will mean that hopefully it will be less strain, therefore I can... Um, capture with no dropped frames. So let's give it another go. Let's capture. We'll rewind a little bit because I just keep going through the same clip, same clip, 
the tape is probably going to disintegrate. <laughs> so I'm not sure if we have to drop the um, quality at all of the compression. Um, you know, it's kind of crazy how many options are in these preferences. It is night and day compared to current Final Cut. But I am going to give up for today because I am at the point now where I've tried a good few things and I've spent considerable time on it. I've probably been in here a good three hours, I guess, between trying to get those hard drives to work and whatnot. So it's the weekend. I'm going to go and spend some time with my family and I will come back to this at a later date. So it's a few days later and I've just finished editing exactly what you guys have just seen. Um, I'm pretty much going to call it a day here. What I was going to do was tackle this again and continue part two, but I'm not going to do that because I think half an hour is plenty or over half an hour is plenty for a video of this nature and I can just make part three when I'm ready and you know I'll probably be recording part three either tomorrow or the day after or whatever. Um, so what I need to do now before saying goodbye is I need to capture the tape again because as you guys all know in the video earlier on you saw the capture but I deleted the initial capture because I was re-erasing drives and all that kind of thing. So. I don't have a capture to insert into my timeline here, so I need to recapture it again and then put it into the timeline. It's really confusing because you guys have already seen it much earlier on in the video and I, you guys know before me how many frame drops and stuff are going to be during that clip. So it's actually pretty damn interesting. Um, what I'm going to do is boot this system up and figure all of that out later on. I've got to make some dinner first and eat some dinner. Um, but the edit is done and I haven't, you guys are now fully up to date. This was the last thing that I tried and it didn't work. But who knows, maybe we'll have some magic miracle and when we turn the system on today, it'll work just fine. So I recaptured my footage and I now have that footage in my timeline on this machine and I am gutted to say that obviously as you guys know because you've already seen the clip there are multiple frame drops and it didn't fix itself overnight which is not very fun I was hoping that it would but that's okay all of that aside I feel as if I'm making great progress I'm enjoying myself as I've said multiple times throughout this video this is the kind of stuff that I'm really into and it's very rare that I actually get to use a PowerPC Mac for something this tasty. So I'm really crunching away on the Power Mac G3 and I'm really trying to squeeze this performance out of it. Um, there's probably some setting somewhere that I need to change and as soon as I change it, bang, will be sorted and the footage will be great with no frame drops. I really hope that's the case because I really want this to work out. But anyway, I'm going to sign out of part two and I'm going to say thank you so much for watching as always everyone. It may be a slight delay before part three because of course this is all in real time. I've got to do the research at the same time as you guys are actually watching these videos flow out. A little bit like the series that we did with the world's fastest G3, the actual upgrade of it. This is all in real time. I'm not filming everything and then putting it out to YouTube afterwards. This is me right now on the same day that I'll be uploading this telling you guys that I have now got to go back to the drawing board and figure things out. So that's why there, there's a delay sometimes. And obviously I've got to do that as well as doing all of my other stuff. But I've got some awesome videos planned. There are some awesome, awesome different things on the way. And of course the G3 stuff is making great, great progress. The biggest thing that we did in this video was figure out where we stand with the camcorder, which is a big thing. And the other biggest thing, we got the RAID working again. So very happy. Hope you guys have all enjoyed watching this video. I love making the blue and white G3 stuff. Always have, probably always will. Leave your comments, thoughts, feedback, feelings, questions, all of that down below. And of course, I will see you in the next video, which will hopefully be very, very soon.